So welcome everyone to the second of our virtual lecture series. Um, we are pleased tonight to have Agatha winning and McCavey nominated author Edith Maxwell as our speaker in our virtual lecture, lecture series. Um, she is the author of the Quaker Midwife Mysteries, which features our very own John Greenleaf Whittier in most of the stories. She's also um, written the local food mysteries and the award-winning short crime fictions. She's the um, also writes under Maggie Day and as the County Store Mysteries and the Cozy Capers Book Group Mysteries. So many mysteries. <laughs> she also wrote two Lauren Rousseau mysteries. Um, she lives in Amesbury with her beau and energizer kitten and she as um, she's here with us tonight. I'm going to pass it on to her. Um, thank you, Edith, for joining us tonight. And we are so excited to learn about the new book in your series that just came out um, earlier this month. So take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Kaylee. Um, yes, I live in Amesbury. I write three books a year or more and short crime fiction, all mysteries um, and all historical or cozy mysteries. So you're not going to find gratuitous violence or swear words or um, there's romance, but they close the bedroom door before it gets too exciting. So those kinds of books. Um, and the, it is true that the a Changing Light is the newest Quaker midwife mystery. It's the seventh one in the series. It came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, the Quaker midwife mysteries feature Rose Carroll, now Rose Carroll Dodge. She got married in book five, uh, book six. And um, she's an independent woman in her mid twenties who is a midwife. Um, she apprenticed with an old woman midwife in Amesbury and um, who kind of gave her her business when she had, she couldn't, the Orpha, the older one, couldn't work anymore. Um, and Rose rides her bicycle around town and attends women for prenatal care and in their labors and births. Um, in the first book, Delivering the Truth, um, she became involved in a couple of mysteries. So um, the impetus for this series was the very real carriage fire, the Great Fire of 1888, which was in April, early April. Um, and it burned down most of the carriage factories. I'm pointing that way because that's the direction it is from my house, um, on Carriage Hill. And Amesbury was world famous for its carriage factories. Um, Rose solves the arson of the mystery of, of who lit the fire, the arson. Historically, it wasn't arson, but I write fiction. Most of it's true. Um, and then someone is murdered, and two people are murdered, actually, in the first book. Um, she, at that, in the first, in delivering the truth, she it sort of is in conflict with Kevin Donovan, the detective of the Amesbury Police Force. And um, he's telling her, you got to stay out of this. Well, if you know anything about the fire, maybe, but the murders. As the series goes on, he comes to accept her help. Um, she goes into women's bed chamber. She hears women revealing secrets during the throes of labor that they would never tell a male detective. Um, and so they, they, by book seven, they've developed a working relationship. Jared Greeley Whittier comes into the first book. Um, <clears throat> one of the reasons, well, about the same time I started writing these books, I, 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 I knew about the, John, the Whittier Home Museum, which is halfway between my house and the Whittier, uh, um, uh, the, the Amesbury Friends Meeting House, where I've been a member since 1989. And like I knew it was there and some of our members of our meeting were active in the Whittier home, but I wasn't, I just didn't really get involved. And then I started looking into it and I became a docent in training and 
you know, I have access to all the research materials and it's been uh, Chris Bryant and Sue, um, uh, dear, well, anyway, she's our, she's our lead, lead docent and lead um, researchers. I'll, I'll come up with her name. Um, people have been so helpful to me to providing with providing materials and letters and um, so so I include Whittier in these books as he's an elderly you know he's in his he's up there he's in his late seventies he's um, or eighty and um, he's a mentor to Rose he's a he's a Quaker friend so he's a lowercase friend and an uppercase friend and um, you know, he kind of goes to bat for her sometimes, or he helps her, or he's a sounding board. And I really love um, including him. He's the only real character that I include in the series, except in the third book, which is, has a theme of women's suffrage. I have Elizabeth Cady Stanton coming to Amesbury. I don't know that she actually did, but she might have. She traveled and talked to a lot of people. Um, so here's just a little bit from Delivering the Truth, the first book, which was nominated for an Agatha Award for Best Historical Mystery, a McCavity Award for Best Historical Mystery, and it was the Amesbury um, Book of the Year, um, sponsored by the library in the Whittier home. And um, it's wonderful. So here's just a little, a little bit. Um, at meeting for worship. Actually, it was at the end of a memorial meeting for worship. So a memorial service, Quaker style, for a, for a Quaker who was killed in the Great Fire. When I'd entered with Frederick and the children, oh, and by the way, Rose lives in the first few book, first five books with um, her late sister's husband and his five children, her nieces and nephews. He offered the, her the use of a room in the house if she would sort of help with the household and the children. And Faith is the, is the oldest child who is a teenager. When I'd entered with Frederick and the children an hour before, I glanced at John Whittier, already seated with straight back in his customary seat on the facing bench, watching people stream in, Little Betsy's hand was in mine, and I saw him wink at her. She looked up at me delighted and then waved at him before he closed his eyes. To the outside world, he presented a serious, almost stern demeanor. From what I had seen, he loved young people and wasn't above a wink at them. And um, I wrote that, and then I started thinking, ooh, did he actually like children? <laughs> and I, I have the Woodbury um, definitive biography. It's downstairs now. Um, and I started reading through that and reading through the other materials. He loved children. Whittier loved children. So I don't know, like I wrote that in my fiction and then I, and then I researched it as sometimes happens. And he loved children. So that, that made me feel good. Um, we see, you know, in the Whittier home, like you can just walk right into his office and his desk is there and his top hat's there and his glasses and his books. And um, so some of the scenes, Rose is talking to John in his office. Um, and I just, I just love bringing him in. Um, oh, I should, I also meant to mention, I'm sorry, I forgot my whole intro. Thank you for inviting me, Kaylee, and the Whittier birthplace. Um, it's, I've, I visited years and years ago, like in the early nineties when my, my boys were little, they're in their thirties now. And I think we went to the Christmas thing one time where it was probably Gus, um, being Whittier and reading, you know, um, Snowbound. Uh, and I didn't get back for a, f a couple decades. Um, but I had met Gus Rice through the, um, the curator and tour giver for many years through the Whittier home. And um, I was fortunate to have a short story published in Murder Among Friends, uh, which all proceeds benefited the birthplace a couple years ago. I don't remember the, the um, copyright. And um, they had a signing party for the authors 
at the birthplace and Gus gave us all a tour. And I asked lots of questions and he took along as much time as we needed, as I needed, you know, about Whittier. Um, so that was a real treat. And um, I've heard he's retired now, but um, he, he's a treasure, Gus Reich. Um, in the second book in the series, Call, uh, Call to Justice, um, it has a theme of, um, you know, so this is still 1888. This is, what, 20 few years after the Civil War ended. And people have an idea that New England was, you know, there weren't any slaves and there weren't any, um, you know, pro-slave owners. It's not exactly true. Um, and there was still quite a lot of racism and anti-slave um, sentiment in New England at that time. Um, a, a, a Quaker mill girl is killed during the fireworks. So this opens at the 4th of July in 1888. Um, and I found an account in the Newburyport Daily News uh, archives in Newburyport of the 4th of July and the ceremonies, the festivities. They had a, um, a Horribles Parade, which is a parade they still have in Rockport or Gloucester every year. It's, it's really goofy floats. And um, there was an account of the Amesbury Police Station. Their float was a, an outhouse on a cart labeled Amesbury Lockup with two of the Amesbury officers dressed up as bobbies. I put that verbatim into the first scene of this book. Um, the, there's a statue in downtown Amesbury, um, a couple blocks from here, of the Josiah Bartlett, who was the first, who was an Amesbury resident, who was the first to sign the Declaration of Independence, I think. Um, and that statue was funded and dedicated on the, it was funded by um, the Huntington family who were a carriage, carriage factory um, people. And it was dedicated on the 4th of July, 1888. So that had to go in. Anyway, that night uh, during the fireworks, which they had in 1888, um, there's a Quaker mill girl who's killed. And um, a former slave whom, who Whittier had, um, uh, benefactored, that's not a verb. Anyway, he was a benefactor for this former slave named Akwazi. And Akwazi is falsely accused of the murder. Um, Rose digs into it. Um, so here's a little scene with Whittier in this book. And I, I should mention, if you haven't read the books, that Whittier and Quakers at this time still used the and thy. They used the um, sort of archaic way of speaking that they had begun a hundred or two hundred years earlier, so as not to honor when you was the um, like the honorific, and the and thy were the familiar forms as Latin languages have, um, Latin-based languages um, by by 1888, everybody was using you. So it was setting them apart again. Um, but they were still speaking in the and thy. And I used that for all the Quakers in the in the series. John sat up straight. What's that thee says? A quasi? Our a quasi? I'm afraid so, Rose said. It's possible the killing was accidental because there were so many reckless men firing guns into the air that night. And I believe this accusation is a false one made by a man who harbors great resentment against coloreds. Still, Akwazi is in jail at present. I just came from there and he needs help. Can the, I shall summon my good friend, Benjamin Lee of Newburyport. He's a skilled criminal lawyer and a friend. That's a capital F. <clears throat> He'll see to it that Akwazi is freed and then absolved. John leaned over to his desk, selected a sheet of paper and a pen, and began scratching out a message. I hoped thee could help in this way, Rose said, or 
I'm sorry, this is in first person. I watched as he wrote and wondered how dashing off a quick letter differed from the process of composing a brilliant poem like Snowbound. But of course I'll help. I regard Aquasi as almost a son. He has survived great travails in his life and he does not deserve even a minute more in a state of misery because of deceptive allegations. So that's from um, Call to Justice. In the, the third book, so the, so the first book was in April, Call to Justice is in July, and my books in a series tend to occur in book time, three or four months apart. And I was thinking about the fall and I went, 1888, oh, that was an election year. Okay, I got my, I got my theme, <laughs> we're doing women's suffrage. Um, so Turning the Tide is the third book. Um, I haven't been telling you when they come out. This one came out in 2018. They they come out every year since 2016 with a little um, slippage and overlap. Um, so the book, this book opens, Turning the Tide opens with um, at a at a meeting of the Amesbury Women's Suffrage Association. Again. I don't know that there was one, but there certainly might have been. And, and the speaker is rallying the women to turn out in protest on polling day, on election day, across the street from the polls um, with their placards and demand the votes for women, which of course they didn't get for another 30 years. Um, didn't, didn't earn for another 30 years. We have to be careful of our verbs. Like, Women weren't granted the vote, they earned the vote. They, they, they got that thing. Um, and the next day, Rose is cycling home from an overnight birth and she finds the body of the leader of the suffrage organization, the body under a, under a bush. Um, so, but they do turn out on election day and Rose's mother travels from distant Lawrence. It took her all day on the train to get from Amesbury to Lawrence and from Lawrence to Amesbury. And believe me, I researched my train details very carefully. I, I heard that the historic train people get very upset when you get things wrong. So I did a lot of work to find timetables and how you would get to Lawrence, to, to Amesbury from Lawrence and how long it would take. And you had to change twice, you know, Georgetown and Bradford. And, um, Anyway, her mother comes to, her mother is a suffragist and she comes to support the, the Amesbury women. So here's a little bit, including Whittier, on election morning, when the women are standing out. Uh, with their placards and one of my favorite placards, I don't have a picture to show you, but it's on. Um, I'll have to find it. I'm sorry. Maybe I could email it later. Uh, it's like women give birth to everybody. Shouldn't they have the vote or something like that? It's, it's very appropriate for a midwife to hold that. But, um, so John, uh, I, uh, John Whittier was strolling toward us, swinging his silver tipped cane. Good morning, Rose, he said. May I stand with the ladies for a bit? John, thee is most welcome, and we thank thee for thy support. It is a worthy cause. Might I borrow thy placard? He asked Bertie. Bertie is Rose's friend, the postmistress. She grinned and handed him the sign. Be my guest, Mr. Whittier. He held the sign in front of him. He didn't smile, but I caught the characteristic gleam in his eyes. This was a man accustomed to acting contrary to society's expectations. Uh, Rose, I mean, uh, Bertie then admires one of his poems, um, The Lakeside. And she recites a bit of it to him. I'm just speaking that. John smiled at her. I wonder why thee burdens thy memory with all that rhyme. It is not well to have too much of it. Better get rid of it as soon as possible. Why, I can't remember any of my scribblings. I glanced at him. Surely he was teasing. I once went to hear a wonderful orator and he wound up his speech with a poetical quotation, John went on. I clapped with all my might. Someone touched me on the shoulder and said, 
Do you know who wrote that? I said, no, I don't, but it's good. It seems I had written it myself. And that I got out of the Amesbury newspaper. Um, like that was in a newspaper article. They quoted Whittier saying that like, I can't remember what I wrote. And somebody said, that was good. Ha, huh, you wrote it. Um, those are the little bits of research that I, I absolutely love working into these books. You know, that um, nobody who reads that might know that that's an actual, you know, passage from a, a newspaper article, but, but I do. Um, I have other bits of research I do like that. Um, I found when I was starting this series, I found a um, like a replica, a reprint of a manual of police procedure for uh, Massachusetts public safety officers from um, 1880 and it has all the procedure and all the um, you know regulations it has little case studies and from that I learned I'm sure Claire's heard me say this before but from that I learned that when a police officer arrests someone they have to touch part of their body they have to touch their shoulder and say I place you under arrest and like apparently so there's no mistake as to who they're talking to. And I've included that in my books with Kevin Donovan, the, the detective. Um, you know, again, nobody else in the universe might know that this is a fact, but I do. And I'm, I'm those are those little things I like to bring in from research that, that kind of bring the books alive. So those three books, we're all nominated for an Agatha Award for Best Historical Novel. And the Agatha, if you don't know, is it's kind of like the Oscar for traditional and cozy mysteries, um, Agatha Christie. Um, it's presented every year at the Malice Domestic Conference. And it's a huge honor. And the next book, book four, Charity's Burden, was also nominated for an Agatha. And it won last year at a virtual conference that we didn't even get to make acceptance speeches. So it was kind of a letdown, but it's a huge, huge honor. There's only five books nominated every year in each category. Um, this book, I don't think Whittier's in at all. Um, it's in the dead of winter. It's in January or February. And um, it has a theme of um, contraception and abortion, which were, very, very difficult um, um, topics at the time. Um, around 1980, 1880, the um, Comstock laws. So Comstock, it, it's basically what happened was after, um, you know, after, after um, emancipation, and black men were getting the vote. And uh, there were a number of white men that were very, very threatened. Sound familiar? Um, and uh, there was a guy named Comstock who passed through these very restrictive federal laws um, that you couldn't even share information about um, preventing pregnancy, not to mention preventing birth. Um, and then states, different states passed more restrictive versions of it, including Massachusetts. So Rose is a midwife and women come to her for their pregnancies and births. They also come to her for female care. She's their gynecologist, right? Um, and if there's a woman who has five children, her husband lost his job and she can't not have any more children. She comes to Rose. Um, Rose does not advise. She she advises on herbs. Um, she would not at that time. What I think in the book I called mechanical pregnancy. You know, some sort of physical removing of a fetus was life threatening. She did not recommend that to anyone. But these women were hurting and and desperate. Um, and there were apparent, there was rumors of a couple of people in Amesbury in my book who were performing abortions, um, not herbally. And 
anyway, that's the whole theme of that book. Whittier is, it's cold. He's off in Oak Knoll with his cousins in Danvers. And um, so I have nothing to read from him in this book. Um, but that book won the Agatha last spring. And, and I, I just feel very grateful because I was worried, was I gonna offend readers with this topic? Um, I wanted to make it true to the time as I do for all the books. And I think, I think readers saw them, so. Um, <clears throat> Oh, my file's getting mixed up. There it is. So the next book, so that's book four. Book five is Judge Thee Not. And um, I had to move to another publisher for this book. Um, the publisher of the first four books was a division of Llewellyn, which is a big publisher that does mostly like self-help and kind of, uh, I want to say woo-woo, but, you know, astrology and different things like that kind of books. And they decided to drop their crime fiction line, their criminal, their midnight ink crime fiction line, dropped a whole bunch of authors, including me. Um, I wasn't done with Rose. I wasn't done with the series. So I moved to a different publisher. Um, yeah, that's all I'll say about that. Um, so this book um, I have a good friend in Amesbury, Jean Smith, who I've known as long as I've been in Amesbury. She's uh, a Quaker. She was part of the Quaker meeting before I was in Amesbury. Um, and she's been blind her whole life. She said a successful career as a social worker and raised two kids and she's a musician. And, and I thought, I want to, I want to have a blind character. Um, so I modeled um, Jeanette Popka on my friend Jean Popka Smith. And um, this book also brings in, so this book kind of touches on prejudice against the other abled. In that time, um, in the late 1880s, the whole late end of the 19th century, people thought blind and deaf people were morons. They just thought they were mentally deficient. And um, I spent a day doing research down at the um, Perkins Institute in, in Watertown, had a wonderful tour with their research librarian. They opened up their library. Um, but also Bertie Winslow, who I mentioned earlier, Rose's friend, the postmistress, she lives in a Boston marriage. She's a lesbian. She lives with her lover, um, Sophie, and who's a lawyer. And um, Bertie pretty much doesn't care what people say about her, but there are people in town who have a lot of judgment against blind Jeanette, who's an interpreter for the courts, and against Bertie, and against all kinds of people, and immigrants. So that's kind of the theme in these books, in, the, in this book. Um, this is a little scene that doesn't have much to do with the mystery but it shows Whittier in his native habitat. Um, <clears throat> I thought that it would be fun to read. Uh, Mrs. Kate, John Whittier's housekeeper, had led me through the garden where the elderly poet sat in the shade of one of his prized pear trees. Ah, Rose, do join me on this fine afternoon. He smiled at me from under snowy brows, his thin face showing the passage of time in its furrows and loosened skin. His dark 81-year-old eyes were clear, though, and had the same intense focus I'd seen in them ever since I'd met him. Mrs. Kate, please bring Rose a cool drink, if thee would be so kind. And then this takes place in the summer. <clears throat> After the lean woman had gone back inside, I said, I thank thee, John. Tell me why thee doesn't address her by her Christian name after the manner of friends? He smiled. I respect her and her husband's wishes. I am a weathered and seasoned friend, Rose. One must not be rigid in these matters. I winced inwardly. I had often displeased people by refusing to call them by title and surname. Also, Mrs. Kate wouldn't simply wouldn't stand for my addressing her as Caroline or her husband as George. Neither she nor her esteemed husband are friends, as thee must know. I rely so on both of them. I don't know what I would do without the pair living upstairs here and caring for the house in my frequent absences to and 
to hither and yon. So Judge and Mrs. Kate it is. Um, and that book was nominated for an Agatha Award too. No, that one wasn't because I had two books come out that year. Um, so th that book came out in April and this book taken too soon came out in the fall. And this book has been nominated for an Agatha this year and we'll find out in July if it wins. In this book, so Rose has been courting David Dodge, who's a doctor in the report and not a Quaker. Um, they've been courting since the first book. And this book opens right after they get married. And my fans who have been following this series kept saying, they were starting to say, are they ever gonna get married? And his mother is an Episcopalian and she was against the marriage and Amesbury Meet Quaker Meeting was against it because she was marrying out. She was marrying a non-Quaker. And that, that stricture was put in place in the early days of the Quakers because they were so persecuted and they didn't want to dilute their numbers. Now, Kathleen Wooten, I hope she won't contradict me at this, but she knows the history better than I do. Um, but as I understand it, they didn't want to, you know, they, they really wanted to put a lot of pressure on Quakers to marry Quakers and build the numbers um, rather than marrying out. And then you would lose that one and you would lose that one. By the late 1800s, it didn't matter so much. It was loosening up. Um, but Amesbury meeting in my fiction was still quite adamant about it. Um, so Rose and David end up getting married in Rose's home, like birthplace meeting in Lawrence, where she grew up, um, who were more liberal about those things. So here's just, I don't want to go on too long about this. Um, no, anyway, I won't read from that one. But but um, Whittier did um, attend the meeting, the, the wedding, and gave his blessing. And then Rose and David take off for West Falmouth, which in the late 1880s was a, was a hotbed of Quakers. It's like it was basic, West Falmouth on the Cape Cod was basically founded by Quakers. And I go down there, in fact, I'm going on Sunday. I rent the a Quaker retreat cottage there a couple times a year during the off season for a week of solo writing and I get tons of writing done because I'm by myself and there's no Wi-Fi in the cottage. Um, but when I learned that it was, there were so many Quakers there at Rose's, in Rose's era, I thought, oh, I have to set a book here. So she and David, right after their wedding, they get summoned down to visit her elderly, her two elderly aunts and um, aunts and solve a murder while she's there. And I had a lot of fun with that book. Um, so we come back to Amesbury for the next book. And I'll tell you, I have to confess, it's the last book. So I'm ending the series with A Changing Light that came out two weeks ago. Um, it's a business decision. The people who love these books adore them. And there aren't enough of them. Because I write three books a year and I can't like, spend one third, one fourth, one third of my year my precious writing time writing a book I don't make very much money on. Um, even though I love, I've loved writing these books and I have a number of short stories uh, featuring the characters in era. So, but I always want to set a book during um, the, the, the spring opening. Um, so as I said, the Amesbury was world famous for their carriage factories. And every year the carriage factories would throw open their doors. They People came from literally all over the world. They came from Australia, they came from Brazil, they came from Canada um, to look at the carriages and buy them and do business during the day. And then the evenings were balls and galas. And um, I thought I really, I wanted, I've always wanted to include that in a book. So this book um, I did, I dug deep as I do into the theme of each book. So it was actually spring, it wasn't even actually spring, it was early March um, <clears throat> when they had the spring opening in, eight, in 1890. We're up to 1890 now. And there were so many changes going on. That's, that's when um, the horse-drawn trolley in Amesbury became electrified. 
they ran wires and it became an electric trolley that ran from the chain, the chain bridge along Main Street, up Main Street into town to Market Square and then back. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, people were starting to talk about horseless carriages, about automobiles, and they were inventing them in, in uh, Germany. Um, <clears throat> but tuberculosis was also a scourge. It was, you know, a, a terrible pandemic. Um, and I wrote this book last summer during a terrible pandemic that did not have a vaccine or a cure at that time. Um, so you can imagine that my heart was really into it. Um, and I, I read a fabulous book about finding the cure that um, includes Arthur Conan Doyle. When I saw that, he, he was involved in looking for a cure for tuberculosis. I thought, okay, I definitely have to include that. Um, <clears throat> um, the former president of the Amesbury Carriage Museum, Mary Chatney, had been the high bidder to have her name in the book at an auction for the Carriage Museum a couple of years ago. So now the book opens and we find Rose meeting um, Dr. Mary Chatney, tuberculosis specialist. Um, that's been a lot of fun. I, she hasn't read it yet, but I'm looking forward to her reaction. And um, there's a lot of change in Rose's life. She's actually pregnant with her first child and her beloved Orpha, her midwifery mentor all these years um, is dying. So I thought A Changing Light, that's a good title for that. I worked back and forth with my editor on that. Um, and of course, Whittier's in this book too. And here's just a little bit with him and then I'll shut up and let you ask questions. Um, <clears throat> which part did I wanna read? Oh, so um, this is at just after a Sunday regular Quaker meeting worship at the Amesbury Meeting House. I don't think I said that I've been a member of Amesbury Meeting for 32 years. So I know this world. I know the language in the meeting house and all that. So that's another reason this has really been a series of my heart. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> So uh, John walks out of meeting yeah, on the arms of this guy that um, Rose has seen once or twice around town, uh, the green-eyed Brazilian. Uh, John walked out on the arm of the dashing Amado. Ah, Rose, dear, John said, has thee met our visitor? Not to speak with. I am Rose Dodge. I extended my gloved hand. Instead of shaking it, the Brazilian lifted it toward his face. I opened my mouth to object, but it was too late. He pressed my hand to his lips, then relinquished it. Mrs. Rose Dodge, I stressed my title, something I usually avoided. I wanted to be sure this flirtatious man knew I was married. I am Jorge Amado. I'm honored to make the acquaintance of this famous man's friend. I have sought out the great poet because I too dabble in the art. He's written some very nice pieces, John said. Alas, I can only read them in translation. <laughs> anyway, that's just a little bit. So John has befriended this Brazilian who's giving him Portuguese lessons. And uh, um, and then things things get get exciting shortly after that on Sunday in this book. Um, so that's, that's, that's pretty much all I want to say about the Quaker Midwife Mysteries. As Maddie Day, as um, Kaylee said, I also write two contemporary cozy mystery series, um, country store mysteries and the cozy capers book group mysteries, which take place on Cape Cod. Um, but I'm sure people have questions if you want to unmute him. Let's have a, let's have a chat about anything. Writing practice, books, Quakers, whatever it might be. If you don't have any questions, I can always talk more. 
Well, until somebody else comes up with a question, um, I just wanted to to thank you on behalf of the Whittier Birthplace for giving this speech. Um, I'm definitely going to go out and buy the books now that I know a little bit more about them. And I'm sorry that I haven't discovered them sooner, um, but they sound they sound really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. And the, you know, the Merrimack Valley Library Consortium has all of them too, for sure. So Susan Vesey, you had your hand up? Susan, who is not Susan? So you're okay. muted. You have to well, unmute. I think, I think you are Sue Art. Oh, I did the clapping thing. <laughs> that was the clap. Um, I was wondering. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I, oh, I sorry. unmuted myself. I wanted to thank you for your talk tonight. I found it very interesting. Um, I'm sort of a, a history buff. I'm not a scholarly historian, but I do know that the Whittier family were among the earliest of the Quakers in this region of uh, Haverhill, Amesbury, and, and the Merrimack Valley. And, uh, and, and I find it very interesting, uh, the way they led their lives and how they coexisted with others uh, in this area and the very early, uh, early colonial days, particularly with the indigenous people who lived here, who kind of left them alone, so. Do you have knowledge about how they, um, about the indigenous people at the time? Well, I, I've only read the, in, in history that while, as you probably know, and we, there's a lot of controversy going on with the Hannah Dustin statue in Haverhill, uh, which surrounds the days when there were a lot of French and Indian attacks, but I have read, uh, not in great depth, but several times that um, the Quakers in Havel, which basically were the um, the Whittiers and and, uh, and and several other local families, that the indigenous folks who came down left them alone. They they never they never raided them. Uh, they may have visited, um, but they knew that they were peaceful people. They knew that they were um, uh, would treat them as uh, equals in mankind, if you will. And uh, I, I find that to be an amazing fact that um, that, that happened back in the 17th century. Mm. In the 17th century, wow, yeah, thank you. I was, I was looking for information about um, Indians in Amesbury at Rose's time. I looked really hard and I couldn't find any. Um, I think people might, they might've assimilated or you know, been in hiding or whatever. Um, I really wanted to write a Native American midwife. And so actually in, um, I did in Taken Too Soon because I have a lot more information about the Wampanoags in, on the Cape and the Mashpee. Um, so I, in that book, uh, she does work with a, with a Wampanoag midwife. Um, she meets I, one. I, I will read it. I will read it. I can guarantee you. Uh, because it, it fascinates me. Uh, thank right you. here, I can show you if I could pull it out. I can't, but uh, there's a fascinating book that I wrote about, uh, that I read about the pilgrims um, when they landed uh, in, in Plymouth and so forth. And, and it's a fascinating story and a very candid story about what the true relationship was between the indigenous folks and the pilgrims and how they were interdependent and how at times they fell apart and sometimes through misunderstanding, sometimes through mistrust. But it's just fascinating when I, when I read it. it, mm. it I found it to be a very forthright account, unlike what we learned about as school kids, um, yeah. of the Indians sitting down for Thanksgiving dinner. Right, 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 right. No, they've, they've been doing a lot of such good work um, on the Cape with the Mashpee Wampanoag and the, and yeah. the new the new work that the Plymouth, um, they're not calling it Plymouth Plantation anymore. What are they calling it? They're calling it Plymouth Patuxet, yes, which is right. the name of the Wampanoag village that was what we then called Plymouth. Right, 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 yeah. No, I mean, I'm not a trained historian at all either, um, but I've found I love being an amateur historian and I love hanging out in the, Amesbury room at the public library with the research librarian, um, Margie, Margie Walker, and um, walking around town and looking at buildings and imagining my stories. And actually Rose and the family 
lived in my house right here, which is one of three houses that was built in 1880 for the mill workers, um, where at the Hamilton Mills right down the street where like where Flatbreads now is, if you know Amesbury and Amesbury Industrial Supply. So um, it's been a real treat to you know work in and I have maps from 1880 and 1890 and I have digital versions so I can zoom in on businesses and street names. I love I love doing it and researching daily life and stuff. So Sarah has a question. You seem to write pretty quickly. What's your secret? Oh well. Um, I left my day my last day job my most recent day job, which was writing technical manuals um, uh, eight years ago. And I treat my fiction writing as a job. Um, I'm working by seven every morning. And that's after about an hour of sort of internet and email and blogs. And um, if I if I like sleep in till 6.30 or something, I'm, I'm wasted. I can't, I can't start work at seven, I'm panicking because I have to have my hour. <laughs> of internet. Um, but that's pretty much what I do. And I have contracts for three books a year. And I write short stories in the in the odd corners. And last year I wrote four novels. Um, and I don't know, like I'm not retired. This, this is my job. And it just makes me so happy. <laughs> I love doing it so much that it's not it's not onerous. I mean, I don't clean or anything. You know, I'm not going to show you that rest of my office that you can't see but um were you a writer by education or did you sort of pick this up later in life you know i've never had a college class in creative writing um i wrote constant fiction constantly as a child um i won a con fiction contest from the pasadena star news for a short story called the biking girl um when i was a nine or eleven and i they gave me two dollars so that was my first paid fiction um and then i kind of put it down but i did i did journalism and academic writing and and then i got into this career as a as a tech writer um and i but before i i had a few years home with my kids and i started writing a mystery novel yeah. um mostly because that's what i love to read and um I just sort of kept at the novel and at short stories and then kept on going. And um, now I have 24 books in print. Wow. Uh, I typed wow. the end of my 29th novel um, two days ago and I'm about to start the 30th. So uh, I don't have a secret except that I really focus and I treat it as my job. Oh. And I don't, um, if I'm at all blocked, I change modalities. I'll sit back in my rocking chair with a pen and paper, or I'll go for a walk and talk out loud to myself. And ideas always rise up. So I'm, I don't, I don't experience sort of writer's block. Very impressive to me, at least. But I've been doing this for a while now. So let's see. Um, Yeah, okay, Sarah's got more questions about writing. You know, I, I interleave the research with the writing. So I'll do some, especially for historicals, you have to do a lot of research. But once I had done a good amount about the late 1880s, I kind of had that down. Like I know carriages, I know what people wore, I know what they ate. Um, and then for each book, I'll do more research, you know, on suffrage, um, contraception and abortion, whatever it is. Um, but then plot, I don't really plot ahead of time. I mean, I kind of plot as I go. I just write into the headlights. And for me, that works. Some people need to plot out every scene before they start writing. And that would bore me to death if I knew what was going to happen before I started writing. So um, that's just how, but that's individual for writers. And some writers plot, little, and I, I'll plot like three scenes ahead maybe. And then I'll write those and I'll think, oh, what needs to happen next? So, oh, okay, that needs to happen. Jay Cleary has his hand up. Go ahead, Jay. Jay. As a young girl, did you read every one of the Nancy Drew mysteries? <laughs> of course. And my mother was a big mystery reader. 
so and our our house was filled with books from both my parents and my mother had the whole living room which had a very high ceiling the floor to ceiling shelves were filled with agatha christie and earl stanley gardner and niall marsh and like everybody and i read all of those and i read um I think one reason I'm a, I'm a fiction writer, I'm a fiction author, is that I have a hyperactive imagination and I always have. So as a kid, I, I was nine and I was reading Sherlock Holmes and Poe. And then giving myself nightmares. And, and I wasn't allowed to watch Twilight Zone and scary movies because I would get nightmares. But somehow my mother never made the connection to the nightmares of what I was reading from her bookshelf. Um, so yeah, I read, I got, I cut my teeth on them for sure. And I think almost every mystery author I've talked to, any mystery author friend, crime writers, we all read Nancy Drew. Did you have a question, Linda? I didn't know if you were. I just want to say that I, I honestly believe that you know, being nominated for the, all, all these, you know, these um, titles is, is wonderful. And it's not, it's, it's really prestigious. Thank you. I love mysteries. I honestly do. And I really appreciate mystery writers. Oh, thank you. Well, I'll tell you, you know, since I started going to New England crime writing, crime writers events about maybe 15 years ago, I've never met a more generous group of people. And in a sense, we're all in competition with each other. Like we're all authors and we all want all the readers, but readers read a lot of books and really it's no competition. Like, you can be my book and Claire's book and Hank Fulby Ryan's book and Hallie Efron's book and there's still plenty, right? You can read a book a week, you can read three books a week. So, um, but really there's, people have been so generous and they've blurbed my books and encouraged me and given me critiques. And, you know, now I'm able to give that back to other people, people who are coming up. Um, so, but the, absolutely, the award nominations are huge. Um, um, thank you for recognizing that. Yeah. <laughs> Differences between a, being a Quaker and Rose's time and now. Sure, I can try. Um, uh, now, some Quakers have a glass of wine. <laughs> um, we don't. So there are these principles that, that many, most modern Quakers sort of live by, um, the, the um, guidelines, principles, simplicity, equality, they're, they're the values, um, nonviolence, integrity. And those, those were the things that sort of combined to lead Quakers, early Quakers to wear plain clothing and Plain, plain dress and plain speech and not not be extravagant in their personal lives. And I would say that many modern Quakers continue that. Like you'll see us wearing kind of our thrift store jeans to, to worship. And we drive Priuses because we value the environment. And um, maybe old, old Birkenstocks with socks. This is a joke among Quakers, Birkenstocks with socks, gotta do it. But, um, you know, uh, um, it's the values of of being of all all are equal in God's eyes. That we all have that of God within us. We're all children of God, and and that's why we so we are equal that way. We that's why we don't. How can I kill you if you have that of God in you? That's why people Quakers are pacifists. Um, and you'll find that we wear a kind of individualistic uh, version of simple of plain dress. So in Rose's day, they she would be wearing 
um, the Quakers tended to wear muted colors. They didn't have to wear gray or black, but muted colors and no frippery, you know, no lace, flounces, feathers, and, you know, plain, plain clothing that might have for women were about 10 years old in style. So it might update, but for 10 years late. Um, I, I'm still wearing clothes I wore 10 years ago. Um, I think I think abstinence, you know, not not drinking alcohol, not dancing, things like that were more stressed then. I don't know for sure um, in Quakers in in Rose's day, but she certainly adhered to that. Um, but she might have gone to see a musical performance or a theatrical performance. Um, I don't know, Kathleen, you want to chime in? Kathleen's my resident serious Quaker here. I don't know if she wants to. I would, I would say the same thing. I would say that the, the thing that was, um, the things that are different maybe now is just kind of the way they play out in the world. Like I, I know that uh, Quakers used to do plain dress in order to, the point was to be, not be distracted by uh, thinking about God and thinking about goodness by having, you know, worrying about clothing and those kind of things. And today I know a lot of Quakers that they don't, they don't select clothing based on those style choices, but maybe they select clothing that is secondhand or that is, they mend a lot of things instead of, so there's the simplicity of trying to walk lightly on the earth, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. So I think sometimes the, the things have changed because life has changed on the outside, but then those basic testimonies of simplicity and peace, I think are still pretty much the same and just played out in different ways in a more complicated world. Excellent, thank you, yeah. Yeah, I think modern Quakers might pick organic cloth maybe and other, other things to reduce, reduce the impact on the, on the world. Which is why when you go to a gathering of New England Quakers, you'll never see so many Priuses in a parking lot. <laughs> it's great. Uh, Qua Claire's seen me dancing. Yes, you have, Claire. So yeah. No, I'm a I'm a I'm a possibly bad Quaker when it comes to drinking and dancing. I love it. Love both of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is great. Any other questions? You know, I hope that I'm on, um, well, I'm on Facebook way too much because I love it and I'm slightly addicted. Um, but my website, edithmaxwell.com has, um, you can sign up for my newsletter. It's got all my writings and short stories and history and everything. And I hope you'll check that out. Um, <clears throat> the Quaker Midwife Mysteries are available through the Merrimack Valley Library Consortium and wherever books are sold. The first four books are not available new anymore in paperback because of this deal, this thing with the first publisher, but they are all available as ebook. And the last three books are available as paperback. And <clears throat> Jabberwocky Books in Newburyport and 18 Friend Street in Amesbury um, sell both of them, sell all of them. And this Saturday, for the first time in a year and a half, I'm having an in-person author event in Amesbury at one o'clock from one to two, it's actually 12.30 to 2.30 at the new Amesbury Industrial History Center. Um, oh yeah. Sponsored oh. by the Amesbury Curates Museum. Oh, great, great. And we're gonna, you're gonna, it's not gonna be a usual book launch party. We're not gonna have wine and cheese. You have to wear your mask. But I'll be selling, we'll be selling all my books and there'll be a raffle for a really cool Amesbury um, themed um, gift bag. And uh, if you want it, it's gonna be a nice day. So if you wanna come down to Amesbury between 12.30 and 2.30 and come on down. So it's right in the upper mill yard, right next to Flatbreads, the new industrial history center. Yep, I know where it is. Love to see you. <laughs> and tell me you were here, you know, tonight. So. Well, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. I know some people have to sneak off. I would just like to give a plug for the next virtual lecture in our spring series with Whittier Birthplace. 
we will have John Babin from the Maine Historical Society, who's going to be speaking about another one of the fireside poets. Um, he's going to be speaking about Longfellow and the book that he wrote. Um, so I just put the link in the chat. It's also available at our website at whittierbirthplace.org slash events. Thank you so much, Edith Maxwell. We are so excited that you were here with us today. And I think all of us are going to go out and find your books, either in stores or in the libraries. Thank you, everybody, for coming. It's just really been fun. Take care. I hope to see you in person sometime. Absolutely. Good night, everyone. Good night.